So it, it's, you know, the first, uh, first talk of the day to start everything off. Um, what you have here, and I really want to thank Jeffrey for the invitation, and then you all, the STD community worldwide, for welcoming me to come. Um, something that I really have become a believer. Um, yes, I've drank the Kool-Aid STD um, safe. Um, <clears throat> thanks to one of um, our parents, my parents, um, Giselle Woodward in the back, whose um, two children I diagnosed with Crohn's and um, she, um, uh, and you, many of you have heard her story, wanted to do something other than medicine and we sort of have been taking this journey together. Um, uh, and really incorporate, um, I think, the power that you have here is, this is a real community. And there's so much that we have to do. And what I hope during the course of this presentation um, is to give you the framework of where I think inflammatory bowel disease, and you can name almost any disease that affects our immune system. And now, because of the exciting world of understanding the microbiota and microbiome, um, lots of different things, um, how important nutrition and diet is in terms of health. Um, so hence, um, it's elementary, my dear Watson, so the GI tract and why it can be, uh, the specific carb diet can be effective. Um, so greetings from Atlanta, um, where at least we don't have a professional sports team that's doing re reasonably well, but at least in the south, as my Chattanooga, Tennessee uh, folks will tell you, it's about, um, I, I really learned about the religion of college football um, and where they come on Wednesdays um, to start um, the uh, um, tailgating until the actual game on Fridays. During the course of this um, talk, what I'd like to do is to give you, I'm an epidemiologist at heart, so I actually have a cross appointment at CDC in foodborne and diarrheal diseases. Um, which sort of keeps in line with what I do for a living. I'm a poop, vomit, burp, and fart doctor for children. Um, <clears throat> that way I can get w away with almost anything at the dinner table. Um, and, you know, it's just sort of part of what I do. Although my um, now 26-year-old um, uh, daughter, when she was a, actually, Braxton, right about your age, um, she, her chore, one of her chores was clearing the dishes and my wife, who's an elementary school teacher, was already up and doing some homework. And she came and she was clearing the table and I was looking at work email. I pulled up an email and I had, one of my moms had sent me a picture which really was so high definition it was almost scratch and sniff of a diaper w mixed with, and I'm sorry this is right after breakfast. Um, but my daughter looked at the picture and then she looked at me and then screamed, mom. Anyway, so I've been forbidden to look at the work email at the dinner table. Um, so that I can't do, but I can talk about almost anything. So I'm gonna talk about, um, and the reason why I have epidemiology is to understand that this is a growing problem. This is, a, this is a condition that helps every one of us. And it's neat to see so many different regions of North America represented here. Um, but it, it really affects everybody. And that's why as a community, in terms of teaching and educating people about diet and why this cause um, is, an, is an important aspect of, of fundamental therapy, I think is key. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, and try to put it in a way so that you understand why this diet is so important, how IBD starts and autoimmune disease and sort of immunology 101. And what I think, if you think about what we've learned from this disease since 1932, when Dr. Crohn's described it in, his, in three of his relatives, um, how much more about the different types of IBD and subtypes amongst the three main types and how actually the type of the disease actually dictates what its natural history is, how it will respond to therapy um, and what to expect. Because as a parent, um, the, the thing that you want most is to understand what's going to happen two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. I'll talk about what I think is also important and why at least I would never take care of grown-ups. In pediatrics, it's a team. So parents, kids, um, are the providers, we have two clinical psychologists that are part of our practice, we have four nutritionists that are all lactation certified that are part of our practice. It's a team taking care of each individual patient. Um, and we'll talk about why um, this is important. And then outline dietary approaches, um, particularly focusing on SCD, and then really leave you with a few snippets about where IBD needs 
the management needs to go and how, again, communities like this are important in influencing change, changing attitudes of, of the traditional um, uh, clinician um, and how they look at um, the patient. So first about the epidemiology, this was, and, and I'm a firm believer in that, there, that, that it, no one person can do this alone. It takes um, a village, if you will. Um, and this was the very first consortium, so multiple centers of pediatric centers, actually UCSF was one of them. Um, Harlan Winter at MGH in, in uh, Boston was the leader of this consortium. And if you look at this, so over 1,300 children with inflammatory bowel disease from nine different centers across the United States and two important things that we found. So the y-axis for your orientation is frequency, the x-axis looks at age and years, is how many children we were diagnosing under the age of eight or six. And in fact, at that time, there were just case reports of children under the age of six, and now we're diagnosing it down into the infancy age. So not only is the frequency of this condition increasing, but the age at which it's diagnosed um, is, uh, is um, also uh, increasing. And if you look at this um, a paper, a, a lovely review published in Nature Gastroenterology and Hepatology um, uh, just a couple of years ago, it shows you with the map of the world um, on uh, your, your right, um, where the, this condition is now occurring in populations that Previously, it's never been described. Crohn's disease and UC affect, at least based on best estimates, over 2 million Americans, 25% or more are diagnosed before their 20th birthday. And I will venture to say in some of the conversations we had last night that many people who are diagnosed as an adult had symptoms that were occurring during childhood. They just never quite connected the dots. There's a global distribution of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis that seems to be similar. It's interesting, north-south gradient, higher rates um, in northern locations. Used to be rare in Asian countries, and now, in fact, I'm going to a meeting in Tokyo, there's a, a dramatic increase um, in this disease being diagnosed in children in Japan and in multiple parts of, of Asia. Ashkenazi Jewish population, um, ethnicity, highest prevalence, highest in Scandinavian countries. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is that we're seeing an increase in minority populations. We were one of the first to actually publish it in African-American children living in Atlanta. And what was kind of special to me is that the lead author was a fellow of ours, Ceci Ogombi, who's from Nigeria. And she, even to this day, has said that they don't recognize it in her home country in Lagos, um, except for once or twice a year. But yet that population comes to the United States or to Canada or the UK and you start to see it. Best case example I have is recently I diagnosed a six-year-old um, uh, boy um, uh, who his father immigrated from Mexico to uh, Atlanta at age 16, went to Georgia Tech, um, is an engineer, and the dad got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at 35 and now has his son who's been diagnosed at age six with fairly severe Crohn's disease. Um, and what was interesting about that, I'll first sitting down with the father who was just feeling tremendously guilty about it, something that I did. Um, um, his family, he comes from a fairly affluent family in the um, western part of Mexico, and you can go back five generations, and it's very difficult to see um, uh, if there's any autoimmune disease in that family. Yet he moved to the US at age 16, and his diet, and now his son being born in Atlanta, um, things change. So again, it represents one of those um, aspects of this condition that we really may be had or have been missing the boat. Um, a very wonderful paper, so a shout out to the Canadians. Um, Charles Bernstein, a dear friend um, who's an adult gastroenterologist, he's the head at University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, has been doing some outstanding epidemiology over the last few years using a population-based database. Um, and in fact, in this paper just published uh, about three or four months ago, he's showing that in Canada, it's increasing about 3% per year in different populations. They're now seeing it actually in the, in the native Canadian population in which no autoimmune disease has actually been described. So this condition, at least as diets have changed, is starting to occur more frequently. All right, so that's a snapshot of the epidemiology, and I hope that gives you a flavor, at least, of 
where I'm heading in, the, in, the, in this discussion or this talk. And I think it's important to recognize the framework in which we're seeing because if this community continues to grow, it's gonna be important to reach out to people at the time of early diagnosis so they can start thinking of things um, that they can do from a dietary standpoint. So now I'm gonna talk about how this disease occurs. And I think this is important to take home because this is why the diet and what's going on in your gastrointestinal tract and the microbes there um, uh, may be um, critical to understanding how it happens, how the disease, um, its natural history is, and how you treat it. So, okay, so this is um, immunology 101 from a poop doctor. All right, so this um, shown here, so here's the lining of the intestine. Up here are different things that you ingest. Here are the microbes, and they get in and they're called antigens, so pieces or proteins of these, um, uh, uh, whether it's, uh, it's um, uh, particles that you ingest, food, um, the microbes that are already living there, and they get to these um, uh, inflammatory or immune cells, I should say, called T cells. And T cells have the ability to differentiate into two main pathways, Th1, so T helper is what um, it, the Th stands for, and Th2. And then these cells talk to each other, they talk back to the intestinal epithelium, they talk to the blood vessels, and then they send out signals that go around the body um, uh, uh, in terms of the both good and bad parts of your immune system. And these things called chemokines are chemicals that these inflammatory cells or immune cells make that talk to other immune cells, talk to the intestinal lining, even now we know talk to bacteria and microbes that live in the gastrointestinal tract and other parts. And it's actually as we become to learn more about this condition and went from the years back in the 1970s where you just threw steroids at people constantly and other medications where these compounds called biologics are targeting these different um, upregulated or increased um, proteins from the early step in the pathway that inflammatory cells are making. So Th1 cells are responsible for providing responses when you get vaccines, um, for protecting um, uh, the, your mucosa from different things, and then Th2 cells with humoral immu immunity. And when you upregulate these things, you get disease. So in autoimmune disease, whether it's MS, juvenile inflammatory arthritis or IBD is an exaggerated response of the immune system where that then the body's immune system attacks itself. What's interesting is you see here for allergy, it's the same thing. It's an upregulation of the inflammatory process. And this is why, for example, in countries where there's poor water hygiene, poor infrastructure, where there's lots of exposure to parasites, there's a very different immune response. And one of the reasons why there's still a clinical trial going on looking at giving parasites to people with inflammatory bowel disease to upregulate the Th2 response and drive it away from the Th1 response. And some of the early data in that has been actually pretty promising. I'm not promoting this morning to feed little creepy crawlers to each other. Um, but again, it raises this important point about where we need to head as far as um, uh, the immune system. Now, what about the microbiota and this real, I think this is the most exciting area in, in medicine today. And um, I've spent most of my career researching a single microbe called H. pylori, which is the cause of gastritis and ulcers and can cause gastric cancer. And the, the two gentlemen that discovered it got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2005. And sort of, it was an easy evolution for me to go from a single mi microbe um, to the rest of the GI tract and maybe how these organisms um, that are living there normally might be involved in disease. So there are 100 trillion bacteria that live in our GI tract. 10 times the number of human cells in our body. If you remember, 23,000 genes we have. So 23 and me, that's where that comes from when the human genome um, was sequenced. Um, the sea slug has 50,000 genes. So they're actually more genetically complex than we are. Um, but if you add in the bacteria, and actually it's not just bacteria, it's, it's protozoa, it's viruses, it's fungi, um, you then have um, 
100 times as many genes as there are in the human genome. And in fact, we really are more bacteria than we are human. And I think what's important, so this is a logarithmic scale, so the y-axis is an exponential um, uh, tool to look at number of genes. Here's human genes, here's microbial genes in the body. Um, and so we're really more bacteria than we are human. And we used to think that it all began at birth. It's actually happening before people are born. There's a reason why there are studies now that show that if you give women probiotics in the last trimester of pregnancy and their child is at risk for developing allergies compared to placebo, and then you give the child probiotics for the first six months of life compared to those that get placebo, there's less likelihood of that child developing allergies at one, two, three, five years of age than the ones that got placebo. So things happen even sooner than at birth. And there's a whole lot of exciting data looking at the fact that how you were born, whether C-section or vaginal delivery, whether you were breastfed or bottle fed can affect the microbiome and then um, uh, result in health or disease. The Human Microbiome Project was funded by the NIH um, initially in 2008. They finished the first cycle. There's been some really exciting research that's come out of that. And then they now have a new RFA request for funding. So people are putting in applications looking at that. World Microbiome Day, in case you guys didn't know, was in June of 2018. And in case you want to go to a very nice place, but actually see all the experts in microbiome in Barcelona 2020, um, World Microbiome Day will be celebrated there. So there's a lot of focus around the world looking at the microbiome in different compartments of the body and how it actually may relate to health um, or disease. And if you look at the number of papers that have been published, so the y-axis is publications per year, the x-axis looks from 2006 to 2018, and then in fact actually the different colored lines relate to different diseases. There's a whole host of papers now looking at the microflora in the body and how it relates to health and disease. So I really do think this is one of those areas that um, we're rethinking how we look at everything with respect to um, our health and, um, uh, and, and the way we interact with our environment. And in fact, again, I'm biased because I'm a pediatrician. I don't think I could ever take care of grownups um, and I wanna stay a kid most of my life or if not all of my life. Um, and I, the focus really has to be on kids, particularly if you're thinking about what I would like to say where we need to go, at least in the IBD community, is not just a cure, but prevention. So preventing the condition from happening in the first place. And this lovely paper just published recently looks that early reports, we used to think that by three years of age it was all done. There was this really cool study where these authors that was published in a not so insignificant journal Nature, where these authors went around the world and yes, they collected poop specimens from uh, people living in Alaska, Greenland, in Russia, um, Latin America, and Asia. And they showed that by about age three, in this paper published about three years ago, that um, it starts to stabilize. The CDC actually did this study looking at EIS officers, the, that stands for Epidemic Intelligence Service. So these are the people, the trainees, that they send to the outbreaks first before the scientists come in later. Um, and they collect all the water, the food supply, and figure out where the outbreak's coming from. But what they did was, yes, they collected poop specimens from these EIS officers. And they, because uh, they wanted to see how long it took for you to live in a different environment before your microbiome changed. And it took at least six months of eating, sleeping, bathing um, in an environment that's different than the one they came in before you start to see some stable changes in that um, microbiome. Um, and in this paper, the highlight here is that um, uh, studies now suggest that development of the microbiota may take longer and that uh, deviations of this development may have consequences later in life. So in fact, actually up to about age 10, 11, and 12, there's still ample opportunities. And that's why I like this take home point um, that children may provide additional opportunities for microbiota based interventions. In other words, diet, nutrition, um, uh, to promote health or prevent uh, microbi uh, microbiota deviation 
and that the gut microbiota of children may be more malleable to environmental factors. A certain way to think about it is there's a reason why people who were born in the house, infants who are born in the house that has a dog or a cat, are less likely to develop dog and cat dander allergies by age 10 than people who the dog and cat was brought in later on. Or there's a reason why people who are born and raised on a farm are less likely to develop um, uh, um, infectious or autoimmune disease and allergic disease than those that are not. One of the best commercials, which totally was not meant to do this, that I think that's out there is, and I can't even remember the product of the commercial, but there's a little toddler that's sitting at the table and dad, of course, we don't do things as, as neatly as, as, our, uh, as moms, is feeding the kid. He's got stuff all over his face. And if you look carefully, there's a little dog that's sitting by the sliding glass door window. He hears the door open, it's his wife coming in, um, and it's like, oh, I gotta clean the kid up. So he runs away, comes back to clean him up, and the kid's face is spotless. The dog is <laughs> licking his lips. Um, and so there's microbial cross-transfer that's going on, and that's part of the reason why um, I think that um, you, you see some of this. So why is this happening? Why are we seeing this inc tremendous increase in autoimmune disease and allergic disease? And what are we doing or not doing right to cause this to occur? So if you look at the incidence of infectious diseases over the last, um, this is 50 years, and there's a paper that um, I'm promised by my colleagues at CDC is coming out that's going to look out to 2015. Um, Rheumatic fever, hepatitis A, measles, mumps, TB are all going down. Um, these are vaccine preventable disease. But what you need to look here is on the right, if you look at 1950 to 2000, and remember that immunology 101, so T helper one, an exaggerated response, T helper one, these diseases are going up tremendously. I have three very dear friends right now who are dealing with various stages of MS, um, all physicians, and not one of them has a family member that has autoimmune disease. So again, scratching the head, why, why is this so? So my sort of hypothesis to this, and this has been discussed in the literature now a lot recently, is that a decrease in infectious exposures, change in the human microbiome or microbiota, have been associated with an increased immune and inflammatory disorders. Something's happening early on. Maybe we're becoming a little too hygienic in what we do, um, uh, and, and it's causing a change. For those with kids, Braxton, I'm sorry if, if this uh, is going to um, uh, strike home. There was a wonderful study, over 1,000 Swedish children ages 7 to 8, and they found in this particular study, don't ask me why they looked at this particular factor, but the parents, um, in, the kids in the families where the parents made them wash the dishes by hand, um, compared to those where they stuck it in the dishwasher, those children were less likely to develop allergies and autoimmune disease than the kids that stuck them in the dishwasher. So here's for chores. There's a medical fact as to why you need to do your chores. Or a, um, a friend of mine who's a health reporter for the New York Times, a geneticist says that any new parent, Ben, here you go, should roll their child on the floor of a New York subway. And here's why. <clears throat> Right, we gotta enrich that microbiome, right? Well, okay, I'm an evidence-based guy, you gotta have science here. So a paper published in a not so insignificant journal, Science, shows that farm dust and endotoxin prevent, prevent allergy um, and asthma in lung epithelial cells. Basically what that means is if you live in a farm, there's actually a biologic mechanism by which you have a protection to your immune system to develop allergies and asthma. So C-sections, sanitized food supply, including infant formula, decrease in naturally fermented foods, urban lifestyle, and antibiotics has increased the rate of allergy and autoimmune disease. Does anybody know what the C-section rate is here in Massachusetts? Anybody? What's that? 30%. 30%? Yeah, so nationwide, the, and this is elective, not emergency. Elective C-section nationwide it's 33%, but that depends upon the zip code that you live in. There are certain parts of Atlanta where it's 63%. That means third child is being scheduled the C-section between the soccer and the flute lessons, and then we'll get the C-section done. That's the elective C-section. 
And there's direct implications um, in terms of the microflora that the child is colonized. Why? It's the reason why there's actually an NIH study now going on with um, vaginal fecal trans I mean vaginal flora transplant in children who are born by C-section. So there's a lower microbial exposure early on um, in life. There's an altered intestinal microbiota and an inadequate immune response. So I have to take these examples at home. My son, now 29, um, a Stanford graduate, was a, and he gets embarrassed whenever he listens to me give this uh, talk or a talk like this. He was a pacifier sucker from way back. We were scared Chris was going to actually graduate from high school with his pacifier. Um, and tried everything, read every book. I was talking to all my colleagues, our clinical psychologist. How are we going to get this kid to get off his pacifier? I mean, he went to first grade with two pacifiers in his pocket, not in his mouth at least. And when his pacifier fell out, it was like Dr. Gold doing ESPN top 10 highlights, diving through the air to catch the pacifier before at the ground. And if my wife was along, she'd like, Ben, I've got three other ones in my purse. Just pick that one up. We'll give him a, a clean one and we'll sterilize that when we get home. Or my mother, who's very good at embarrassing me at the right or wrong place, who said, ah, Ben, you had pacifiers when you were little. When it fell out, I'd pick it up, I'd lick it off, and I'd shove it right back into your mouth. OK, wait for it. Pacifier cleaning practices and risk for allergy development. Remember, I'm an evidence-based guy here. Parental sucking of their infant's pacifiers may reduce the risk of allergy development, possibly by immune stimulation of microbes transferred to the infant by the parental um, saliva. That was 2013, just this past year. Sucking on your infant's pacifier could protect against allergies, research says. Parents who clean pacifiers in their own mouths may reduce the kid's allergy risk. So this very interesting, again, here we're going back to the New York Times where I get most of my um, scientific information from. Your environment is cleaner, so your immune system has never been so unprepared. Um, and this really talks about exposures early on. Or my son who made this observation when he was in middle school, hey dad, look to the left and right of you. We're driving on Highway 285, which is the big beltway that goes around Atlanta. Everybody's picking their nose. Do you ever wonder why people drive in the car just, they're up there, I mean, really going to town without thinking about things? Well, guess what? Should you pick your nose, there's actually some data about what happens in terms of microbial transfer. Um, and uh, Dr. Meg Lemon, a dermatologist in Denver, oh yeah, there's this whole relationship with eczema too, by the way. Um, I tell people when they drop food on the floor, so maybe it's not the three second rule, um, please pick it up and eat it, said Meg Lemon, a dermatologist who treats people with allergies and autoimmune disease. So again, I, I, all jest aside, I throw these out there because I think it's, we really have to sort of break open the, as one of my colleagues who is into quality improvement, we need to just blow all these theories that we grew up with and start rethinking about how um, we uh, um, treat our environment and, and the, in which our children are raised. So why is IBD on the rise? So clean food and water, hygiene and sanitation, selective nutrition, lack of parasites, new antigen exposure, they're getting exposed to bugs that they never used to see before, um, and sheltered housing. We actually showed in a paper that got, just got published two and a half years ago in Cell that if you looked in this paper, we had 250 children with Crohn's compared to about 300 that had ulcerative colitis and another set of controls. And we found a very unique microbial signature in the ileum of those children with Crohn's compared to the other two. And there's a number of papers now that are looking at very different types of microbial communities and people who have disease compared to not. And I think this is really where things are starting to go in terms of understanding why people get disease or don't get disease. Um, a paper published by the group at, in, at Penn, James Lewis is an adult gastroenterologist who's done a lot of work in this area, but you'll see this is a multi-center collaborative group. Um, Bob Baldassano is the head of the IBD Center at, at CHOP. Um, but this looks at from healthy gut microbiota to dysbiotic, that term means that your community of microbes have, are completely in disarray. 
and that there's different proportions or percentages of bad bugs compared to good bugs. And it's that dysbiosis that results in disease. And they looked at previous antibiotic use, they looked at diet from infancy on, so such as breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, and they showed um, in a very elegant way that, th that there were exposures early in life um, that dictated outcomes in terms of specific disease. So high total fat, omega-6 fatty acids, animal proteins have been shown in a number of different studies to increase risk of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Higher fruits and fiber intake de decreased risk of Crohn's disease and high in vegetables decreased risk of ulcerative colitis. So there have been a number of sort of anecdotal studies and most of these came in sort of studies that were focused on pharmacotherapy rather than flipping it around um, and looking at the diet that depending upon what you eat, you change the likelihood or less likelihood of having um, inflammation. A absolutely elegant paper published just last year in Nutrients 2018 talks about the Western diet and the microbiome and the host of human interaction and its role in metabolic disease. And in particular, the take home point from this article were, was in lots of studies that they reviewed um, that the Western diet promotes inflammation rather than um, uh, uh, causes it um, a healthy um, uh, gut or healthier immune response that arises from both structural and behavioral changes in the resident microbiome. And the environment created by the gut, uh, by ultra processed foods, the hallmark of the Western diet, um, uh, selects the likelihood of the dysbiosis to occur and less diversity. So diversity is good for people and it's good for the microbiota. And the more diverse your microbiota, the better your immune response is gonna be or the better your um, immune development is gonna be. There was a lot of press recently about red meat, not red meat, processed meat, um, and a paper that just got published a couple of months ago um, uh, um, um, in the FACES trial. I, I don't know why, but in GI we like acronyms. FACES stands for the Food and Crohn's Disease Exacerbation Study. This was an adult study. Again, you'll recognize uh, James Lewis, although Lindsay Al Albenberg is actually a pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, patients with Crohn's disease in remission, um, and then they looked at disease flare. So these were people already where their disease was in remission, and they actually looked at diet and showed if they uh, developed a flare, and they were looking specifically at red and processed meat, um, and that did not seem to be associated with the time to symptomatic relapse. So again, raises the question that there are lots of studies that need to be done in terms of understanding what sets you up or, or actually what can prevent relapse. So after epidemiology, some now discussion about the microbiome, I'm gonna talk about why this is an individualized disease but needs to be managed as a community or, or in, in um, teams. So Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and it, Crohn's disease, as you know, can affect everything from mouth, anything from mouth to anus. Ulcerative colitis just involves the rectum. And there are subtypes of each of these. And one of the th feelings now is that therapy should be based on the specific disease classification. Um, and understanding that phenotype allows you to predict its natural history. Um, and the term treat to target has come up. And that even means what type now, once more research comes in about what type of diet is going to be better or um, modification thereof. And I think the best paper, and this is what we're starting to use now um, in a lot of different studies, is the um, pediatric modification of the Montreal classification. Only reason why they, the Paris classification and Montreal classification is that's where everybody went to meet and so it became the Paris classification. Montreal classification was a group of adult um, gastroenterologists, clinicians, epidemiologists, and so there's a phenotype of adult GI disease, and this is the pediatric. And the only take home point um, that I want you to leave with is that there's actually a classification for ulcerative colitis and classification for Crohn's, and you can see there's a multiple different set of subtypes, and each of those responds somewhat differently to therapy and or is gonna behave in its natural history. What I try to tell parents is after the initial diagnosis, it's usually a couple of years before you're gonna get an idea of how the disease is gonna behave. 
And that's where getting an understanding of the phenotype is, is key. One of the things I also try to do, and uh, Giselle will tell you her kids start rolling their eyes when I go into this, because I do this every time we have a visit, um, after we've asked how school's going and this, that, and the other, and talked about the girlfriend, non-girlfriend, um, is, you know, where is your disease located? So understanding, teaching them to understand where it's located, whether they've had complications, um, and, and um, how many times have they had any procedures is a part of getting them to be educated in their particular disease. How is di IBD diagnosed? And I think this is one of the things, you know, um, Jeffrey mentioned the, the invisible disease, and I think this is one of the things that makes it difficult, is that it isn't a disease where there's one test and then you get the diagnosis. It's a whole host of things. And as we go through these steps to make that diagnosis, it could be very frustrating and it's hard because you know something's not right with your child and yet um, they've got to go through these, the, the, these particular steps. So the diagnosis is established with the combination, oops, of a clinical features, that's the history and the physical exam, with laboratory abnormalities or not, um, coupled by radiology, endoscopy, and biopsy. Um, and endoscopy and imaging are not the be all and end all, but they're used at least in the initial part to characterize where the disease is, how it's behaving, and, and what its overall phenotype is. And distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, but also um, uh, um, uh, being able to subtype it. So there's not one single diagnostic test. Each test should distinguish between disease and non-disease. And I tell this to all my new patients, I'm not gonna do a test on you unless I can explain to you why I'm doing it, what I'm thinking about, what I'm ruling in, and what I'm ruling out. And I think it, <laughs> thank you. Because we rely too much on just these tools that we have, and we have some pretty cool tests that we can do, um, particularly in, and uh, now that we have these little um, cameras that you can swallow and they tell me, well, actually I do know this, they're working on a drivable one, so that's gonna be my form of Xbox. Swallow this pill and I'll be sitting in my living room, driving along and yeah, I'm coming around the uh, alien now. Um, anyway, um, what did you eat last night? Um, anyway, so you know, try to explain to them that um, sometimes you don't have to do a test, sometimes it's just looking at the patient, talking to them, laying hands on, and then talking to the family. Um, and if you're gonna put them on a treatment, whatever it is, whether it's dietary approaches, it's pharmacotherapy, or it's pharmacotherapy plus diet, they should have a reason why they're starting that. They should have, you should have an understanding when you leave that room of what it's gonna do, and there should be a duration and an endpoint and an exit strategy at least with pharmacotherapy, so that then the patient is able to walk away understanding that, okay, if I'm gonna be on a medication, I'm gonna be on it for X period of time, and then I'm gonna get off it. Um, and the same with anything that we do. So the diagnosis is made by history and physical, blood tests, stool tests, X-rays, um, and endoscopy and biopsy. And there are now some non-invasive, at least in pediatrics, we're used to our parents collecting poop. Unfortunately, in my house, I have no choice, even for our dog, Kobe, I have to collect the poop. I tried to argue with my wife the last time I had to collect a poop specimen for the veterinarian, and she looked at me and she said, uh, no, 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 I teach school, you do with poop. So um, anyway, so I collected Kobe's poop for the veterinarian. Um, and then using this test called the fecal calprotectin, um, and it's amazing today, even given the data, how many times insurance companies are, are challenging um, and, and asking people to go through a invasive test like a endoscopy or get an MRI as compared to collecting a poop specimen. And yet this has values that you can use in um, scoring severity and differentiating between different phenotypes. And this particular paper um, published from multiple centers, Ann Griffiths is in Toronto, Jeff Himes is in Connecticut, um, so a multi-center study came up with this um, uh, non-invasive mucosal inflammation index. Because in the end of the day, you want to heal the mucosa. And it, you should be able to have something that you don't have to 
put somebody under sedation and, and stick a tube in an orifice in order to see that the mucosa is healed. And this index ha um, to non-invasively assess mucosal inflammation in children um, uh, identifies it with very high sensitivity and specificity and utilizes the fecal calprotectin. It's also important to realize that there's a whole host of calprotectin assays out there and they're not all um, uh, as accurate as another. So make sure if that's being done um, to grill your physician on what they're doing and has this test been used. And if you use it, use the same test um, to make sure that the disease um, is um, gone. In this particular test, again, on pediatric patients, it was used as an assay um, that was useful in monitoring response to therapy. So in addition to the history and symptoms, you can get a poop specimen and look quantitatively at whether the disease is um, active. And in fact, I have a number of patients that I know that if I get a sed rate and a CRP, which are markers of inflammation that you get in the blood, they're always normal. Doesn't matter. That's right. Giselle's smiling in the back because with her two children, they don't behave. They didn't read the review article. But fecal calprotectin tends to be one of those markers that um, will go up. So now we're past the diagnosis, the epi, the microbiome, and we're going to talk about treatment. So when you treat the inflammation, you want to induce remission. And I think the important goal is sustained remission, keeping the child, Braxton, able to do his dancing and whatever he does. Um, oops, sorry, I know I called you out. Um, but making sure that they are able to do what they want to do, or if it's an adult, doing the things that they want to be able to do, and then it, it, the, the disease is not preventing them um, from being able to participate in life. You want to chill, achieve mucosal hearing, healing, you want to maintain remission, and you want to minimize complications. Disease-induced and pharmacotherapy-induced. It's interesting, they don't have a diet-induced complication um, there. Okay, I move on. Um, you want to maximize adherence. I think that's the biggest thing, is you got to be able to stick to whatever it is and at least do it for a period of time to see if it's going to work before changing. And patience sometimes is very tough. You want to improve quality of life. What differentiates me and pediatric GI is that you want to promote normal growth and development. Um, I'm vertically challenged, as I tell my patients. One of the other reasons why I went into peds GI and Mary Tall to enrich the gene pool. I'm the shortest in my house. My daughter comes back from London and she hugs me and then she pats me on the head. She says she's doing it in a very endearing way. I don't think so. It's because she's now taller than me. Um, but this is absolutely key, and, and, and this is sort of the subtle thing. That's why Jeffrey's comment about being an invisible disease. I can't tell you how many in my 26 years, 13, 14, 15-year-olds, and I know Erica could probably say the same thing, who came in who were absolutely, they're participating in everything, they're going to school, they're active in sports, but they look like they're a six-year-old or they look like they're a seven-year-old. And, and so that alone is, can be the only way that the disease manifests um, in a child. Oh, and then finally, what's new, targeted therapy, and I think really this is the future, altering and modifying the intestinal microbiome. So there are a number of diets, and this was said last night, copycats and, and the real deal, um, uh, that are being looked at. Um, and you know, five years ago, it was rare that you would see anything that was in the literature, but now there are a number of things, ranging from the specific carbohydrate diet, and I'm gonna go into that in a bit more detail, CD treat diet, um, developed by a group in Glasgow. Um, there's both an animal model and there've been healthy volunteers, and it shows a positive effect in a microbiome that's similar to EEN. Oh, that's the other interesting thing is now, the dietary studies are starting to look not just at clinical signs and symptoms, but using the microbiota to actually look and see if you're actually changing it to a less dysbiotic, a more diverse and healthy um, community of microbes. The FODMAP diet, which hasn't necessarily been um, successful in IBD, but has been highly successful in IBS. And there's a huge, I could come back at another time and give a whole lecture about the relationship between the brain and the gut and diseases like depression, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, aggression, that actually manipulating the gut micro, microbiota influences um, mental health um, outcomes. And the FODMAP with respect to neurogastro and motility disorders has been a tremendous um, uh, um, uh, advance in science. Um, the semi-vegetarian diet developed in Japan, 
um, um, Crohn's disease exclusion diet um, developed by a group in um, Israel. Again, if you notice, there's some common themes here, avoidance of Western style diet. The GAPS diet um, stands for gut and psychology syndrome, um, which has not been shown to have any um, uh, um, major effect in, in the studies in IBD and a whole range of things from Mediterranean paleo makers, allergen elimination, lacto-ovarian, vegetarian, can't say that five times fast, um, fiber diet. Um, uh, so a lot of these have been looked at, but I think I'm gonna show you where the data is. So how does exclusive enteral nutrition work? It was established initially as an induction therapy, meaning that with active disease, this is how you get it into remission. Um, it has a direct anti-inflammatory effect reduction diet, single protein source. It reduces the number of particles that your immune system um, either are confused by or see. Um, it affects the mucus in the gut, um, increasing the good mucus and modifies the microflora. It works in Crohn's, but not as well in ulcerative colitis or spheres colitis. I shouldn't be as definitive as saying not, um, not um, totally because it has been shown in some patients to have an effect. And this schematic, so here's active Crohn's disease, here's Crohn's disease during remission. And I think the take home points here is what I've been trying to point out to you. It decreases the microbiome dysbiosis, um, it alters the antigen presentation, um, and it um, ramps down the active inflammation. So again, the microbiome and its interaction with the gut and with the host immune system is what become affected. Um, by this therapy. Where are we now? And this is sort of a summary of the studies and they're not all 100%. Um, so if you focus on the um, uh, lower right, um, so the success rate in terms of remission rates range anywhere from 32% to 90%. The take home point here is people are starting to study dietary approaches to treatment of IBD and looking at outcomes and not just in the short term, but starting to look at long-term outcomes to be able to see um, uh, if we actually don't have to use pharmacotherapy. This is a paper that was just published a couple of months ago, Crohn's disease exclusion diet plus partial enteral nutrition induced sustained remission. Again, here's the, um, uh, um, the habitual diet um, triggering Crohn's disease um, that I talked to you about. So there's the hamburger, the fries, and, and, the, and the soda. Um, and then here's enteral, exclusive enteral nutrition, and then the Crohn's disease exclusion plus partial enteral nutrition. The take home point being that um, these, this was just as effective um, in inducing remission. And I thought this was a very interesting study just published um, uh, three months ago. The reduction of fecal, this obviously came from the UK because they put different letters in there. Um, esophagus is spelled O-E-S, so it's gourd instead of GERD. Um, so fecal calprotectin during exclusive enteral nutrition is lost rapidly after food reinduction. So they're using a non-invasive marker. And this was actually before symptoms happened. When people started to introduce food, um, they, they actually were able to show when inflammatory markers in the stool started to, to go up. The effect of exclusive enteral nutrition of fecal calprotectin is diminished rather early in food introduction. And stay tuned, there's now two studies going on looking at SCD and introduction. So starting to introduce um, uh, other foods to see when the timing is in terms of fecal calprotectin going up. So clearly people are starting to look at these things and use objective markers that we can and we're used to in, in sort of our, our medical, the medical community to follow. Now, what about the SCD? And, um, you know, Jeffrey, I can't uh, um, uh, do it as well as you probably could. Um, Sidney Haas, um, celiac disease, 1924, a scientific breakthrough on identifying and treatment of pathologic bacterium. Um, Elaine Gottschall, breaking the vicious cycle in the 1940s. NIH, as I said to you before, launched the um, microbiome project in 2007. And there are many disciples of the SCD, at least to date, and I showed you the ones that at least there's data on, there's, they have not been shown to be uh, successful. This is a wonderful um, uh, story if you wanna read it, and I'm sure each one of you could come up, and that's why tomorrow will be a good time to listen to some of these stories who have had success 
and going on these diets. And again, I became really a believer. I truly drank the Kool-Aid looking at um, Jack and Christina, um, Giselle's two kids, and how well they've done all these years, knock on wood, on staying on the SCD um, diet. It's constituents, grain-free, lactose-free, sucrose-free. There's a number of mechanisms. So the carbohydrates promote fuel and growth of bacteria yeast in the intestines and cause an imbalance, eventual overgrowth of bacteria and yeast. Overgrowth impairs functioning of enzymes on the cell surface and results in maldigestion, but it also results in inflammation. And it prevents proper digestion um, uh, and absorption of carbohydrates. Additional mechanisms, they, most carbohydrates remain undigested and provide more fuel for the wrong bacteria. Toxins and acids form and injure the mucosa and excessive mucus that could be produced as a defense mechanism. It actually is good to have snot, excuse me, mucus in the stool. Um, that's there as a protective lining of the intestine. And the SCD restricts carbohydrates available and only allows well-absorbed carbohydrates. As, and I won't for sake of time, and you guys know this far better than I do because you're living with this. These are the foods to eat. These are the foods to avoid. And I just have to put this caveat you know, my hat goes off to any one of you that are doing this, and that's why communities doing this as a village, knowing that you are not alone is absolutely key. These are not easy diets to get on. It's tough. And my son, who is exquisitely lactose sensitive, if he smells lactose, he's running to the bathroom. Um, he also has a number of allergies, and you know, being the millennial that, millennial that he is and using Dr. Google and Nurse Wikipedia, I get this text from him saying, hey, Dad, that diet stuff that you were talking about, you know, specifically that SCD diet, you know, that, 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 that lady and her two kids that come from South Carolina all the time and that you talk to, I, what about sending me those things and see if um, I can go on those and that that'll help me? Okay, so I got our dietitian to send, you know, put, uh, we have them in PDF form, and I sent him the dietary form. Literally, nanoseconds after I sent him the text, I get this. Hey, Dad, are we getting a chef? Um, <laughs> so my son is a software engineer, an IT guy, and, who, um, and his girlfriend is the same, and I, I don't even know when they sleep or when they wake up. And they're, I mean, constantly, and they eat on the go all the time. He's like, Dad, I can't do this. He said, I eat out all the time. He said, so we're going to get a, a chef, right? And that way, actually, you guys can eat well. See, this all worked out, too. You guys can eat well, and, and I can, too. And, and then I'm going to be the one that's really going to benefit from it because I have the problem. So, no, we have not gotten a chef yet, um, but he's working on it. Um, what does the data say? So we were actually the first, Stan Cohen, to give him credit, um, my senior partner, um, uh, and I um, uh, did a study, originally 10 children that were started, but seven with Crohn's on the SCD and no biologic immunosuppressant medicines. Um, during dietary therapy, it ranged from five months to 30 months, so almost three years. All symptoms resolved uh, three months after initiating the diet using the modified Crohn's disease activity index. Laboratory indices normalized or significantly improved. And what was important for us, because many of these patients were simply failing to thrive, hadn't progressed into puberty, um, they had increased in height and weight during the study duration. And you can see, irrespective of the parameter, sorry, so these Harvey Bradshaw, Lewis, PCDI, these are all scores that we use, a numeric score to look at disease severity. And we can, there's a bunch of different ones. There is a specific score that's validated in children, um, and that's the PCDI. But this is set rate, this is albumin, and this is weight. And everything improved during the course of the study. There's another study that got published two years after that um, from a European group. And again, whether they looked at PCDI, this is before diet, 32, four to six months into the diet, it had reduced um, almost fourfold. CRP went down, the, oops, the hematocrit improved, and the body mass index um, remained the same if, if uh, actually got a little bit um, better. Um, this is one year follow-up. Um, uh, published um, uh, again about three years ago. Um, start of the diet, liberalized the diet, and then at one year, um, start of the diet, liberalized the diet, and at one year, and this is simple, and this is immunomodulators. And actually, the diet alone did better 
than with immunomodulators. This study just published last year. Dave Suskin has been a real leader in this area. He's at Seattle Children's, um, uh, www.nimble.org. Um, uh, and in this particular study, and we were part of it, um, we not only looked at the diet and clinical outcomes, but we started to look specifically at what the diet was doing in the microbiome. Um, and in this particular study, it was associated with both clinical and laboratory improvements, as well as changes in the fecal microbiome. So as might be expected, changing what you eat modifies the gut flora and helps in calming down the immune system and results in clinical disease improvement. And it didn't matter whether we were looking at Crohn's, oops, yeah, we looked at UC too. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, that's the PUCAI, ulcerative disease colitis activity index. This is at enrollment, here's at 12 weeks. Um, we also compared Seattle to Atlanta um, and we did about the same. Um, uh, both of us have dedicated dietitians who are completely STD trained and were there as a, as a resource, sometimes 24 seven for the families to um, uh, stick with the diet. And it didn't matter what we looked at, whether it was sed rate or calprotectin, it, they all improved during the course of the study. This very busy slide is what we looked at in terms of the fecal microbiome. And the take home point was that there was a distinct signature for each one of these patients at the beginning of the study and that it pre-diet and that it changed significantly during the course of the study and the diversity of the organisms went up, bad microorganisms went down um, and it correlated with, with changes in the clinical outcome. So clearly this is what, from a mechanistic standpoint, the diet's doing with respect to um, um, IBD and why it's been so successful. Ongoing studies, so we're involved in a national study called PRODUCE, um, where we're looking at the SCD versus a modified SCD. Um, it's been really tough to get patients to enroll, surprise, surprise, um, partly because a lot of patients either come already on the diet or Again, there's this fear of, okay, um, I gotta do a diet, and can't you just give me a medication that's gonna make it go away? Um, a double-blind controlled study. Um, there's another study that's being done in the UK on low-protein SCD and ulcerative colitis, reverse-engineered, that's a little scary, um, exclusive enteral nutrition in Crohn's, diet study, low residual versus SCD, yeah, in adults. They're a little slower to catch on, the adult gastroenterologist, but they're starting to get it. And the cd Dine study, um, which looks at SCD versus the Mediterranean diet. This uh, wonderful review that um, got published, and Dave Suskin was one of the authors um, in nu Nutrients just this year, reviews dietary therapy for IBD. And I think this is what's key to take home, the vision of the future. That's why you guys are ahead of the curve here. You've embraced the fact that this has the chance of uh, helping disease without using pharmacotherapy. And the take home point here was dietary interventions with known ability to modulate the intestinal microbiome are a unique opportunity to improve outcomes of IBD. Um, what we think about in therapy is we have to get the disease under control. Those are called induction therapies. And then we have to, and once it's in induction and it's been you know, kind of in the remission state, then we have to maintain it. Um, and these are the different um, agents that we use. Um, and then these are the things that we maintain. And one of the things that I think is very important is that if you look at all the reviews, diet isn't included in one of those um, tools that you can use to maintain it. And I would venture to say that even if you are on either monotherapy or combination therapy, that the diet can actually help the response to the drug and maybe um, even better um, than the drug alone. Questions we still ask, and I think everybody asks, is once you start a biologic, can you get them off? Yes, but with some care and trepidation because at least there's a lot of data that looks at relapse. None of those studies were people on dietary approaches in addition to the biologics that they had. And then what happens to the refractory relapsing child and what about the SCD for both induction and maintenance? And I would venture to say that you could probably put it in both places um, and look at outcomes. Um, this very busy schematic shows you now how much we've learned about the immune system. So think back to those very simple immunology 101 slides I showed in the beginning of the presentation. 
These are all the different targets, the different steps of the path. Now they've got oral biologics that are being looked at as well. But these are all the different targets at the very, as we're getting closer and closer and closer to that very first step where the genes get flipped on and our immune system gets um, ramped up um, in an exaggerated way where the, the biologics are targeted. And I really think that, again, as we understand more about the microbiome, as we understand more about dietary approaches, um, we will um, be able to um, either augment or um, replace um, these drugs. And that's why that needs to be looked at much more closely. So where is therapy headed? We've got to do comparative effectiveness studies. M my job is to help the child not have to worry about their disease and the parents so that that child can continue to be um, uh, a child. It's tough enough being a preteen or teenager in this world, much less worrying about having a disease that you're going to have to live with. So um, as part of the team, and the child is the quarterback of that team, um, we want to help that disease get under control. So the first thing I ask them about when I see them in the office is how's school going? Um, or if they're a soccer player, how's soccer going? Rather than saying, how many poops do you have? Do you have any blood or mucus in your poops? Um, do you have any belly pain? Do you have any mouth ulcers, joint pains? Um, which is typically what we do first. And then later at the very end, oh, by the way, how's school going? Um, you need to, we need to flip that script. Um, we need to predict who's at risk of different therapies and what risks therapies have, as well as we need to um, look at how diet in influences the microbiota. There's been studies out about stem cell um, transplants, bone marrow transplants in IBD. Um, and in particular, there's been some really exciting work looking at um, people who have fistulizing disease instead of surgery or CTONs using stem cell therapy, a lot of the same way that the orthopedic surgeons have been doing, looking at um, uh, um, uh, uh, transplants with collagen and, and uh, um, um, for ligament and joint um, injury. Fecal transplant, this is a hot area. We actually are one of the FDA designated sites for fecal transplant for refractory C. diff. There are two very um, busily active trials in the US and in Canada looking at ulcerative colitis and one at Crohn's disease for fecal transplant. That's poop transplant. Um, you get it from a donor. Um, uh, and even um, some that suggest uh, that uh, it may be an ultimate cure. Um, I don't think this is ready for prime time, but stay tuned. This is the um, ultimate probiotic, by the way. Um, uh, so it's not just the spraying to kill the weeds in the, in the lawn. This is take, getting rid of the whole lawn and then putting back a brand new lawn um, that's healthy. So to conclude and then open it up um, for discussion, what I hope during the course of this presentation is that I try to give you a picture of how this disease starts, some of the immune mechanisms, the epidemiology, the rising incidence of this disease, and, and why it's an important thing that we all need to become aware of and the microbiome particularly and, and, and how it's changed over time. Um, it's complex, um, it's biologically important, and that dysbiosis is what results in the disease. I talked about some of the emerging therapies, this concept of treating to target and exploiting key parts of the autoimmune pathway, and a rationale for why dietary therapy um, uh, can lead to remission and the importance of the fecal microbiome. I'd like to leave you with these two questions, and that is, are we getting close to a cure? And I think we are within the next five to 10 years, um, five years at least, we're gonna be really close. What I'd like to go to is to prevent it. And I think that's where dietary approaches and uh, understanding the microbiome are gonna be what uh, are needed. Thank you so much for your kind attention. <laughs>